My name is Professor John Deanfield, and it's a real pleasure to be here talking to you about primordial cardiology in the youth, what are the limits? Now we're in the middle of a real revolution in healthcare. And that revolution is based on a shift from just disease management to wellness maintenance. Now why is this becoming so important now? As we emerge from COVID and the pandemic, we all realize how important our background cardiovascular health is for our future uh, wellness. And we've learned a number of things that really support this shift towards earlier intervention for disease prevention. The first important thing is that cardiovascular disease begins in the young due to ex early exposure to risk factors, long before the clinical manifestations of the disease. Secondly, we've learned that earlier management to reduce lifetime exposure to cardiovascular risk factors leads to less atherosclerosis and fewer later cardiovascular events. This is something that I've called investing in your arteries. Now, I, to achieve the benefits of this type of strategy, prevention will require a national policy to empower the public from youth to understand better their cardiovascular risk and at the same time understand their opportunities for lifetime benefit from early risk factor change. Now we've long had evidence that individuals dying of non-cardiac disease sometimes have unexpectedly high levels of atherosclerosis in their coronary and peripheral circulations. And this was nicely shown in a study by Murat Tuju at the Cleveland Clinic when he used intravascular ultrasound to characterize the coronary arteries of young Americans dying of non-cardiovascular diseases whose hearts were being used in the Cleveland Clinic transplant program. You can see on the left a 32-year-old woman who died in a car accident near Cleveland, and you can see how impressive her early atherosclerosis is, even at this early asymptomatic phase of the disease. Now we could speculate how many of us on this call already have arteries that look like this, but actually you don't have to speculate too much because if you look at the right-hand panel, you see the burden of atherosclerosis at different ages in around 300 individuals dying of non-cardiac related causes. In the modern era, about one in five teenagers in the United States already have early atherosclerosis. And rather worryingly, for the hearts in those who died above the age of 50, 85% of them had evidence of established atherosclerotic disease. So exposure to cardiovascular risk factors in the young during that long preclinical period is the driver of this accelerating atherosclerosis that eventually leads to clinical complications. Now, I would love to be able to show you a randomized clinical trial that proved that early lowering of cardiovascular risk factors resulted in fewer later clinical events. But of course, that sort of trial is not feasible. But it's here that genetics have really helped us understand both the causal pathway to future atherosclerosis and also the opportunities from early intervention. This is a beautiful study that Brian Ferenc and colleagues did in a UK biobank when they looked at gene profiles associated with LDL cholesterol levels and with blood pressure and their impact on future cardiovascular outcome. Now there are multiple genes that affect our blood pressure levels and if you have a favorable blood pressure genetic profile that results in a small but sustained lowering of your blood pressure, there is an almost 20% lowering in future cardiovascular events. Similarly, if you're born with a favorable genetic profile for LDL cholesterol, a modest lowering of LDL cholesterol as a result translates to an almost 30% reduction in future cardiovascular gain. If you're lucky enough to be born with both a favorable blood pressure genetic profile and a favorable profile for LDL cholesterol, that gain is almost 60%. If you look in the lower panel here, this is the impact of having a gene profile that results in a 10 millimeter lower blood pressure over your life and an almost 40 milligrams per deciliter lower LDL cholesterol. If you can achieve those two levels of risk factor lowering, the relationship with future cardiovascular outcomes was very impressive, an almost 80% reduction in future cardiovascular events. What this suggests to us is that arterial disease causing heart attacks and strokes may be largely preventable by early intervention. 
When we talk to patients, we talk about it being never too late to do something about their cardiovascular risk. What I'm suggesting to you today is that it's never too early. Now, how early should we be thinking about modifying cardiovascular risk factors? Well, sadly, cardiovascular risk factors begin to emerge in the population during teenage years and early adult life. This is a slide that shows you a, the relationship between BMI during adolescence and future cardiovascular outcome. And you can see that obesity levels in the first and second decade of life relate to cumulative cardiovascular mortality in future years. That relationship is largely driven by the development of diabetes and hypertension, potentially modifiable cardiovascular risk factors by early intervention. As a medical profession, we have a challenge in communicating to the public the opportunities that they have from sustained beneficial changes in their lifestyle for future cardiovascular risk. And it's fair to say we haven't done a great job up to now. What we've done is talk a lot about risk, but not too much talk about opportunities and benefit. Now, risk calculators are moving from an assessment of short-term risk that we've used in clinical practice to an assessment of communication of lifetime risk. What's changed is our understanding of the investment opportunity from early intervention of the type I've showed you in terms of future gain. We've moved from calculators that used estimates from observational effects on cholesterol, which showed modest benefit, through to calculators like the Joint British Society calculator that used effects from randomized clinical trials, to novel approaches using the benefits seen from Mendelian randomization studies, as I've showed you, which really emphasize how dramatic the opportunities from early intervention are. In the future, we will be personalizing risk prediction and communication with the public, and we're nowhere near the limits of opportunities in that regard, with development of novel imaging, biomarkers, and genetics to further support our prediction of future cardiovascular risk and opportunities for treatment. So we as a medical profession are going to have to change our role in the future in terms of healthcare. It's no longer sufficient to treat disease better. We have to get involved in personalized prevention for our patients and indeed the public. And we have to act as advocates for societal change for the benefit of the population. So in conclusion, this really is a disruptive moment for cardiovascular disease prevention. We're not at the limits, we're just beginning, and this is going to transform the healthcare environment. We're moving from a disease care system to embrace wellness maintenance, and that is going to require a change in approach from us as doctors, but also politicians, public funders, and private health providers. The challenge is to develop a partnership with the public and the patients to develop a system that allows best and affordable care for prevention over their lifetime so that we can achieve what Ernest Winder wrote very nicely a few years ago, that it should be the function of medicine to have people die young as late as possible. Thank you for your attention. <music>